The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Friends, will you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? We're going to say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. So today's the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the fourth Sunday is the Sunday of love or adoration. And the idea is that part of Advent is not only giving, but receiving God's love, sharing that love with our neighbor, and sharing that love back to God as, as a form of praise and adoration. Today I want to look at a story, and I preach on it every year, but it's awesome. And it's the story of Zachariah's encounter with the angel Gabriel. And, and it reinforces the idea and the power of words. All of us, deep down, understand and experience the power of words every single day. Within every word is an idea that's either true or false. And many of us will take these words and internalize them. Good words, bad words. So much of how we view ourselves are the words that we were spoken, you know, that we received when we were children. Some of us carry some pretty dark words around with us as adults that frame how we see the world. Words of fear, for example insults that we received. Maybe somebody really important in your life called you ugly or stupid. I realized a long time ago that there are certain things that some people don't get offended by, but there are certain like words that really get them. Like for me, when I was a kid, I was called stupid and clumsy. When somebody as an adult calls me stupid or clumsy, it affects me more than if they called me, you know, ugly or something, you know. I, I think that many of us, we have that. We have things like that, that we carry sometimes from our childhood that feel extra painful when those words that we still carry in our body are reinforced. So words have power. We use words to build things. Somebody looked at a plot of dirt where this church stands and said, church, and it became so. And in fact, that is how God created the whole universe. The same way a computer programmer would create a software program, God began to just speak things into being and they became so. He said bird and there was one, earth and there was one. The creation story we see in John, Jesus is actually called the word. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And because of that, disciples of Jesus Christ, people who follow his way, and Jews in particular, believe in the power of the word, that whatever we speak kind of fills the air around us. It creates an environment that when we speak words of encouragement to other people, when we build people up, Somehow we get built up ourselves. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever noticed how if you say something loving to one of your children or to your spouse or a good friend, all of a sudden you sort of feel love in a way? I don't know how else to explain it. But you, when you encourage someone, you yourself sometimes feel encouraged. In the ancient world, they believed that when you blessed other people, you yourself got a little blessing splashed on you. They also believed that if you cursed someone, there was a price to pay. And that price was you yourself would also get a little cursed. It really is true, I think, that when we speak good things a lot, it's almost like the actual air around us becomes more lofty and, and joyful and loving and kind. When we're negative and critical and judgmental and angry and cursing other people and foul, it's like the, it's like... The air around us is, it's not good. 
This is something James said in the book of James chapter 3. He actually asked this question. He said, from the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? See, it's so important that we understand that if you're at the family dinner table and you scream at one person and then you look at the other person on your right and you say something sweet, that scream you just launched is still kind of in the air. It's important that we understand that we train our words because they create, in a way, the spirit uh, around us. They create the, the feeling in the room the, and even what we carry in our bodies. So we want to internalize good words. We want to express good words. And that we always want to tell the truth and we want to have empathetic friends and we want to you know, feel angry sometimes. It's important that we don't in, you know, impassionately just launch out judgment at people, always trying to fix others, angry, cursing, mean-spirited things, but instead we, we encourage others. You know, the Bible says encouragement is a spiritual gift. People need it. People need encouragement, and you're an encouraging person, and I'm proud of you. Keep doing it. Keep using your words. The story today that reiterates this very important biblical message, the power of the word, of the spoken word, is uh, especially poignant in the prophecy and the birth of John the Baptist. So we'll talk about that today. Now, before we get into that, Judaism had and still has this rich sense of hope for a Messiah. And the Bible says, the Old Testament, that there will be a forerunner who will be Elijah, or in the spirit of Elijah, that will come before the Messiah to pave the way and prepare the hearts of the people to receive him. Uh, in Judaism, you might remember the story of Elijah. He had a mentor, Elisha, who he passed his mantle to. And after he passed his mantle, a chariot of fire came and swooped him up and took him up to heaven. So the idea in Judaism is that Elijah never died. He just sort of got raptured into heaven. And someday he will come back to prepare the way for the Lord. So for hundreds of years up until Jesus' point, there was this looking for the return of Elijah who would come and pave the way. And that prophecy becomes true in the story of Zechariah. So Zechariah is an older man. We don't know how old. And he's married to uh, Elizabeth. She's also a bit older. And it seems like they really love each other, which I think is sweet. They're close. They're kind. And the Bible says that they're both righteous. They're both descendants of Aaron. And they both love the Lord with all their heart. But they were never able to have a child. They've prayed. They've asked the Lord. But now Elizabeth is becoming advanced in years. And they think that hope is lost. And she'll never have a child. Now because they're both descendants of Aaron... Zechariah is a Levite, and anyone who's a descendant of Aaron automatically has to be a priest. And the priests are in charge of running the temple. Now, when there are, you know, 50 or 40 descendants of Aaron, this works out really well. But by the time we get to Jesus' day, there's about 20 to 25, 30,000 descendants of Aaron whose sole job it is to run the temple. And so they're like, well, we only have a few things for them to do. How do we get, you know, 25, 30,000 priests to, you know, run the temple? Now, in Jesus' day, the temple was the heart of Judaism. It's where the center of worship was and everything. And the way they did is they broke up these priests into 24 groups of about 1,000. Zechariah was in a group called Abia or Abijah. And of that thousand, they would get two weeks every year in which they would lead the worship service. So they would pick one of the maybe thousand priests. And the way they would do it was by like casting lots, which is like basically rocks that look like dice. And they'd pick one out of a thousand for 14 days of the year. Because of this, most priests never got to do the incense burning in the temple ever in their life. It's very likely that Zechariah had never done this in his whole life, even though he was an old man. And what they would do is they would go into the temple, into the sacred space, and they would burn the incense and do all of the rites and rituals. When they were done, they would come out and they would do the uh, blessing where it looks like this. 
they would make this hand gesture, which is the, 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 the symbol of Sheen, which is for El Shaddai. It has five gaps, one, two, three, four, five, for the five books of the Torah. And, and they would put this shroud that was over their head, over their hands, so you actually couldn't see their hands. It looked like wing, uh, e, uh, wings of eagles. And then they would say, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, etc., etc. Okay? And that would be kind of the end of the service. Zechariah, it's part of one of those two weeks every single year where he has a one in a thousand chance of being able to burn the incense Maybe when he was young, he got all excited that, you know, maybe it'll be me today. And then his 30s came and his 40s. We don't know how old he is. Now maybe he's an old man. Never in his life he's gotten it. He's not even expecting it to come. And all of a sudden, all of these rocks are thrown and everything happens. And everybody's reading, everybody's figuring it out. And they go, Zachariah, it's you. And this old man looks up. And he says, Me? It's this amazing experience. Now remember, the temple is full of tens of thousands of people and a thousand priests and choirs and instruments and worship. And he's never, probably never done this in his life. He has to remember what to do. He's going over, okay, I got to do this, 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 this. Begins to ascend the stairs. Imagine everybody singing the halal, 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 the instruments. I mean, just think of all of the context and the power that He's getting to go and light the incense for the, for the sacrifice. And he's walking up the stairs and he, he goes into this room and into this altar and begins to prepare the incense. And all of a sudden, whoosh, the angel Gabriel shows up and he says, Zechariah. And of course, he's terrified. Whoa, what? So with all these people, it's this amazing religious experience. The angel says, You're going to have a son. Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to be pregnant. And he is going to be Elijah. He will not drink any wine or fermented beverage at all. It's probably calling him to do the Nazarite vow. And he will be a forerunner to the Messiah. And it's just this, he's incredibly scared. It's an incredible experience. He's in the house of God. And he looks at the angel and he goes... And my wife's pretty old. (laughs) I'm pretty old. And uh, the angel looks at him, and in the Hebrew, you know, he's like he's in the presence of God, and there's Shekinah glory and power. And the angel looks at him. He goes. The Hebrew says, "He goes, dude." Really, the angel says, you know, probably in a stern voice, I am angel Gabriel. I stand in the presence of the almighty God. And he says to him, you're questioning this. This will come to pass and you will not speak until it does. All of a sudden, he's just made mute and go outside. You know, people were singing and playing tambourines. Now they're kind of looking at their watches. They're like, why is Zechariah taking so long? A lot of time is going by. People, it's kind of hot outside. The sun's on them. They're kind of looking around, waiting. Finally, Zechariah comes out. He's awfully shaken, worrying. Doesn't know, he knows he has to do this blessing over them. Puts the shah over his head. Puts his hands up. And just goes. (laughs) and then just leaves. And everybody is thinking, what happened in there? It says that all of Judea was wondering what happened to Zechariah, because remember, he can't tell them what happened. Nobody even knows. And like months go by, he still can't talk. Everybody has no idea what happened. And everybody's like, you know, it's all conjecture. Everybody's coming up with, I'm sure, lots of fun stories about what might have happened. And Sure enough, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. Now, Mary also receives a visit from the angel Gabriel. And this is what I want you to see. Everything Zachariah was told was amazing news. I mean, an incredible blessing. He's going to have a son. He's married. It's coming from his wife. Their their prayers are answered. 
when Gabriel visits Mary, she's not married yet. She's a young teenager engaged to this hot guy, Joseph, really excited to get married, putting wedding plans together. They're going to start their life. And she finds out she's going to be pregnant before they're married. And she's supposed to convince her fiance that, you know, it's a virgin. I'm a, you know, it's a, I'm a virgin. Yeah, good luck. So she has, <laughs> literally, she, she has everything to lose. And like a kid, right, like, like a teenager, full of faith, full of hope, just praises the Lord, thanks the Lord, trusts the Lord that this, this idea of his is a good thing and everything's going to be okay. It's amazing, isn't it? What is it about when we're young and when we're older, that as we get old, this sort of realism comes in where we got to tell it like it is. We got to put people in their place. But there's something about teenagers that when they hear the gospel, sometimes they just take it and they run with it. And when they hear good news, they just take it with joy. I think this is a part of what God wants us to recapture um, in our faith is a little bit of this childlike trust of the Lord that Mary had. Well, of course, both Elizabeth and Mary are pregnant, and there's this wonderful story in the Bible where they meet, and the baby, John, in Elizabeth's belly, jumps with joy. It says that even then he was full of the Holy Spirit, and they have this very tender moment with each other where they're hugging, and Elizabeth blesses Mary, etc., and it's, and it's a really wonderful story. That's a great image, isn't it? So she gives birth to this baby, and in Judaism, you don't name the child until the eighth day when it's circumcised. And they ask her, what do you want to name the baby? Now, keep in mind, she's never heard from her husband, John. Just inspired by the Holy Spirit, she tells all of her friends and family, I want to name the baby John. And they all look at each other and they say, John, why would you want to name the baby John? You don't have any family members named John. Why this name? You should name him Zechariah. And she's like, I want to name the baby John. And like, well, but that's maybe another name. She's like, I want to name him John. And they say, let's go ask your husband. Apparently, Zechariah wasn't there. Keep in mind, he hasn't spoken still for probably at least nine, ten months, maybe more. And nobody knows what's going on. And they finally go to Zechariah and they said, what should we name your son? Surely you want to name him Zechariah. And he's like, Mm. You know, like, mm. and they hand me, he says, you know, he's like pointing to a chalkboard, a writing tablet. They hand it to him and they said, what do you want the baby's name to be? And he goes, this is John, by the way. And it says that, look, it's Hebrew, see? I told you I could do it. <laughs> they, he said, I had like 20 people like, don't write it in English, write it in Hebrew. <laughs> so it, he holds this thing up, John, and it says that everybody is filled with terror. Like it was scary to them. Like there was something about this that made everybody be like, whoa, what is this? And as soon as he proclaims, that the names, the, the baby's name will be John. It says that the Holy Spirit filled his body and then he proclaimed, the first thing he said was this prophecy. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Salvation from his enemies and from the hands of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore for our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Everybody's looking at him. Maybe there's tears coming down his eyes and he looks at his eight-day-old baby, and he says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord 
to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the path of peace. And everybody, it says that nobody forgot this story because it was, this is the first thing he said in maybe a year after being in the temple. And it says that they raised that little boy up. He probably was a Nazarite, which means that he didn't cut his hair. He didn't drink any wine or eat any grapes or any fermented beverages, any, any beer or whiskey or anything. And he never touched any dead bodies. And he probably went out into the wilderness and lived with the Essenes, who were like a, a purist, ultra-Orthodox um, desert people who gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls and probably dwelt among them. And it says that later then he would return to be this great prophet and preacher who paved the way for Christ. And we know him as John the Baptist. Powerful, powerful story that reinforces the power of words. It was important that Zechariah not speak another word of doubt against God's proclamation. I don't know why, but there was some reason that it was important to God that Zach, it was like God's mercy that Zechariah could not speak anymore. You know, I think it's important to recognize that we, we have times in our life where we go through something difficult, we have disappointments, and it's good to talk about those things with an empathetic friend, an empathetic witness, and receive comfort. But sometimes, especially as we get older, we go through hardship after hardship after hardship. We just don't want to be hit again. We don't want to be disappointed again. And we get into this mindset where we just try and see the worst so we won't be disappointed. But that's not God's way. God wants us to become the kinds of people who proclaim words of faith and trust, joy, and adoration. And the more we speak this way, it's like the whole space around us gets full of faith and full of hope and full of life. So I want to encourage you this year. You can have an opportunity to talk or not talk, to speak or not speak. And when we get into this really bad place, it, it gets on us. When we spew this stuff out, it gets on us. And I want to encourage you to, one, anytime you have a really good thought about someone, don't assume they know. Take a moment and actually practice love in your speaking. Where if you're thankful for someone, it, it means so much to them. Just put your hand on their shoulder and just say, I'm thankful for you. It's really good to see you. I'm on your side. I'm proud of you. And when you're angry at someone or, or something, it, it, it's easy to want to judge, blame, fix. There's a, there is a love that also comes from restraint. Not that you shouldn't tell the truth, or speak, but, but it's that impulsive, impassioned thing that Bobby Shuler, by the way, does a lot at the dinner table. It, that it's good to practice restraint, that there is a compassion and a mercy in your speaking too, where especially with your people that are close in your life, you, you hold on to it or you wait or you wait for a better time. And watch as that makes, makes a big difference in your life. Words matter to God and they matter to people. They make a big, they make a big difference Amen. in how people experience you and just experience the world around you. And uh, trust me that you, you have a, a gift to offer people. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, first, we use our own words to say we praise you, we worship you, we lift up your name, we thank you, we adore you, we love you. We say thank you for every breath, every moment, everything you've given us, every friend, every church service, our neighbors. We pray, God, that you'd even use difficulties and hard times to train into us more love, more mercy, more compassion, more empathy. Help us, Lord, to walk a mile in the shoes of those we want to judge. Help us, Lord, to become the kinds of people who see the world the way you do. Help us to use our words or not use our words the way you want us to. to. Give us wisdom. More, above all, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. With the Christmas season upon us, Hannah and I would like to thank you for being a trusted friend of this ministry. 
Even in this unprecedented year, many of you have given faithfully and sacrificially to help keep our broadcast on the air, and we are so very grateful. At Hour of Power, we believe there's strength in the Word of God. If you're feeling discouraged and your faith is being tested, open up your heart to Jesus, receive His promises, and know that we're cheering you on. That's right. Well, we've all endured difficulties and setbacks over the past 10 months. Because God has been with us, we have had many opportunities to grow stronger. In fact, we've seen the Lord use this time to draw millions of people to Himself through this ministry to help you grow in your walk with Jesus and to encourage you to devote time each day to the study of biblical truth, we are excited to offer our brand new Bold Faith Daily Reminders of the Fullness of God devotional. Call, write, or go online today and request Bold Faith Daily Reminders of the Fullness of God. This unique softback devotional was created especially for our Hour of Power friends like you. Each day features biblically-centered insights to strengthen and encourage, accompanying scripture verses, prayers, and questions for reflections to help you apply the teaching to your life. Call, write, or go online today and request Bold Faith, daily reminders of the fullness of God. We're asking for your gift of $30 or more. For your gift of $100 or more, we'll send you four copies so you can bless friends, neighbors, and family members with this empowering daily devotional. A perfect Christmas gift. It's our way of saying thank you for your generous year-end donation. In addition, we invite you to seize this moment and become a part of our Eastgate Legacy Walk. For your generous donation of $1,000 or more, we'll honor you by inscribing a 12-inch by 24-inch stone to be inlaid in the walkway of this new project that features your name or the name of your family, the year you began watching Hour of Power, where you are from, and the flag of the country from which you watch. Hannah and I want to extend a final invitation to you to take part in our East Gate Legacy Walk on the campus of Shepherd's Grove. Since you have played such a vital role in helping us reach our milestone 50th anniversary, we'd love to remember your name permanently at our church home here in Irvine. Please, please prayerfully consider this unique opportunity to become a part of our living legacy. Thank you so, so much. And remember, as always, God loves you and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.